Thank you so much to Steve Ford for that video message. And now I am delighted to introduce our rock star panel today. Let me start with Christina Huffington. She is a young person in recovery. She's 25. She's been sober now for two and a half years. Chris, Christina is obviously representing the youth today. Uh, I, I've acknowledged that I am old enough to be her mother, but that is, that is okay. In fact, it's great. So Christina, Christina also frequently writes about recovery for a little website that someone in her family started <laughs> called the Huffington Post. And isn't that neat that you have a website named after you? That's, that's great. That's, what a coincidence. <laughs> She also wanted me to mention um, that she is the proud mother of Lucy the Mutt. <laughs> Lucy lives with her in LA. Our next face will no doubt look pretty familiar to you, especially if you're into football, which so many people are. Chris Carter, NFL Hall of Famer, ESP analyst. We don't have enough time to talk about what a great guy Chris is and everything that he's accomplished, but he's an NFL Hall of Famer, ESPN analyst, obviously, since we all watch him every weekend. And he's been in recovery for almost 24 years. So welcome to you, Chris. Our next panelist is Ruben Castaneda. He's a former Washington Post writer and author of the excellent book, that was published uh, two months ago called S Street Rising. It's a book about the height of the crack epidemic here in Washington, DC. <laughs> Ruben was a young crime reporter covering the crack epidemic. He also was a crack addict while he was covering the crack epidemic. He's written a book about it. It is excellent and I highly recommend that you get it. Again, it's called S Street Rising. And last but not least, Mayor Tim Wilson of Brooklyn Center, Minnesota. <laughs> mayor Wilson has been mayor of Brooklyn Center for eight years. He's been in recovery for 29 years. He's been very, very involved in public policy, and his story is an example of this disease transcending generations. Not only are he and his wife, who's also with us today, not only are they in recovery and they, they know their own personal struggle with addiction, but their daughter died of a heroin overdose at the age of 23 back in 2007. So their story is particularly compelling. So please help me welcome all of our panelists. Welcome. So great to have everybody here today. Chris, I'm going to start with you. Don't be worried. You're on TV all the time. <laughs> I want you to tell me about September 19th, 1990. Um, that was a day. It was a Friday afternoon. Um, I had recently been cut by the Philadelphia Eagles. I think two weeks before that, Labor Day. And um, I had my normal Friday mandatory meeting in, with a, an employee assistance person who was assigned to me, part of my contract. I had to visit with her several times a week um, because of this issue um, that I had. And on that Friday, I remember one of the other wide receivers, his wife was having a baby. And he, we were talking in practice, man, we're gonna go to Applebee's get some ice, Long Island iced teas, and celebrate the birth of his son. And um, before I could go meet him at three, I had to meet with Betty, Betty Trilogy, who is my, my counselor and was the person who, who I feel most responsible for my overall success. And she just challenged me do you think you can stop drinking? Because at that time, I had stopped using crack cocaine. And I was in such a bad shape from crack cocaine 
that I don't even know my sobriety date. And around 2 o'clock, I told her, she said, can you not have a drink for a week? And that began to finalize what became my overall problem, being a crack cocaine addict and an alcoholic. And she told me that I was a drug addict, and she told me I was in the early stages of alcoholism, and could I not drink for a week? So since that challenge, it's been, uh, it's been 12 million, 610,520 minutes since I drank. Congratulations. And I love that you knew that number. <laughs> it took you a minute, but you got there. Yeah. Thank, thank you for that. <laughs> Tissues. <laughs> there is no shame in using a tissue. <laughs> That's right. So, Christina, you have said in, in one of your interviews on Huffington Post that I was watching, you said, addiction thrives in secrecy. I totally agree. Describe the empowerment of getting sober and then sharing your story of recovery. Well, first of all, I can't look at Chris because I'm going to start crying <laughs> if I do. Um, but, <laughs> but, I mean, it was, um, you know, the shame that lifted that first day that I went to sleep and I had not had a drink or a drug that day was incredible. And the shame that was still gone the next morning was incredible. And, um, you know, it was, it was a whole new level of shame that was lifted when I chose to come clean about recovery, which I did at about 13 months sober. Um, I, it is shocking to me, like you said, that I am sitting here at the White House talking about the fact that I am a drug addict. Like, I couldn't tell my best friend um, two and a half years ago. I could not. I had so much shame. And, um, you know, what happened when I, when I came clean about it is that suddenly recovery became a celebration for me. And it wasn't just about the fact that I had overcome this drug addiction. It wasn't about the fact that I live my day one, my life one day at a time not taking a drink or a drug. It became that I have this incredible, beautiful life beyond my wildest dreams because of recovery. And that, hey, maybe I can share that hope with someone else. And that's what I found, especially getting sober, you know, at 22. I thought, like you said, I thought an alcoholic was somebody <laughs> Got in college, I got sober in college. Wow. Um, I left I college know. to get sober. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Ivy League. Um, I left college to get sober, but I did get sober in college. And you know, I thought to be an alcoholic, you had to have lost your job. You had to have lost your spouse. A 22 year old generally does not have a job or a spouse to lose. <laughs> so I kind of had to define um, what it was for me. And for me, it was that I was broken. I sat there, you know, crying every day. I thought I would never get out of this. There were days where, it, quite honestly, I didn't want to live anymore. And that, to me, was enough. I didn't have to lose anything externally. And so that is what I wanted to share with the people when I, um, when I wrote about it was that, you know, you don't have to look like what you think an alcoholic looks like. You don't have to hit that bottom that you hear about. You don't have to have lost everything to turn the page, to turn a new chapter, to you know, have this incredible life. And it was incredible to me the number of people who texted and emailed and called and said, hey, me too. And um, so I'm so immensely grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. When I travel around the country and I share my story, I often talk about the double life that I led, that I had this big career being a TV news anchor on various and sundry networks, but on the inside I was dying. 
and the person you saw on the outside was not the person that I knew on the inside. And I lived a double life. Ruben, talk about a double life. There you were, a young journalist with your dream job, as you described, with the Washington Post, covering the crack epidemic and also being part of the epidemic. That's right. I uh, started out my journalis journalism career, started out my journalism career in Los Angeles. And in the September 1988, uh, I think I was well on my way to becoming an old school alcoholic. I was already at age 27 drinking very heavily. And one day I was out in a pretty tough part of town working on a story when a uh, fetching young lady uh, caught my eye and summoned me over. And I thought, oh, she wants to flirt. I'll put my reporting aside for a second. Well, we made small talk for a, a very short amount of time and then she very quickly offered me a hit of crack cocaine. And I was uh, certainly old enough to know better but also young enough to believe I was invincible. So um, I tried it, and it was actually brilliant marketing by this young lady because uh, the first hit was free, and, and she knew I'd be back. Mm -hmm. So uh, you talk about the double life. I compartmentalized my life and uh, worked my job in Los Angeles, and a year later in uh, September of 1989 when I came to the Post to cover uh, the uh, crack epidemic. So I went to crime scenes uh, as a reporter, uh, talk to detectives, talk to witnesses, talk to the surviving members of uh, shootings. And then on my off hours, I'd go to some of the same areas and buy crack cocaine. Uh, uh, two days before Thanksgiving of 1991, I went to a, a rundown apartment building on 9th Street Northwest, uh, probably less than two miles from here, to uh, meet one of my contacts who procured crack for me. Uh, she wasn't there, but uh, someone who I came to call Big Man, because he was big, uh, was, and he told me, she's, oh yeah, she's just coming out, uh, just come on in. I took a step in, he yanks me in, uh, presses me against the, the door, he calls out for his uh, buddy Slick, who uh, hands him a gun, and uh, the Big Man put the gun between, uh, uh, right between my eyes, and uh, I, I tried to like slug him to get away, it was so ineffectual. He didn't, uh, yeah. he, which was probably fortunate because he didn't even seem to get angry. Uh, but uh, it, it, I, I really, I, I thought it was over yeah. and I just looked down at the floor and I just waited. I thought, okay, it's going to be dark in a second here. And I just thought of my family in California, my parents, my, my, uh, my brothers, my sister, I, just what would they think when, when my body was found? And uh, fortunately, I, I he asked me why I was there, and I said I was there to buy crack. I had a pipe in my pocket. And yeah. I said, check it out, and he saw it was well worn, and he let me go. But that wasn't even the worst part of my addiction. I was taken to a, a rehab, suburban hospital, uh, right before Christmas that year by my boss. Uh, came out in January, and for nearly two months, went to meetings, felt great, mm -hmm. and then I was offered. And then what? And then I, I ran into another contact who offered me a hit, and I did. And it, that was it, it, right? Well, uh, it, we had been taught in rehab that if you stop using and pick up again, you don't pick up where you left off, but in a far worse place. Yes. Far, far worse. Yep. And I knew before I exhaled, I was in trouble. Because uh, then there was this monster that was unleashed in every cell of my body. And it was, was worse when you went back. It was far, far worse. So that night, I went to my usual uh, copying locations, mm -hmm. S Street Northwest, uh, another location. And to this day, I, I consider it a miracle that there was no one out there uh, selling anything. What was the turning point for you, though, as a person, as an addict? And yeah, I'm going to use that word here because it applies. You were. Am. Am. <laughs> Are. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what was the turning point for you? Well, that, that, uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was that night. I, I was unable to buy anything that night. And the next morning, I was still very shaky. And I started wandering my neighborhood, which at the time was a pretty shady neighborhood. Mm. And I thought, OK, I'm probably going to run into somebody who I could buy from. And I ran into this uh, uh, woman who was kind of like the friendly neighborhood heroin addict. Uh, her name was Roxanne. She was uh, very nice, uh, didn't bother anybody, but you know, was 
you, clearly you could see the track marks on her, especially in the summer. Mm -hmm. And she saw I was distraught, and she asked me to sit by, next to her, and I just blurted out everything that had happened, how I'd been to rehab, I'd been doing well, how I'd messed up. And uh, she uh, was very uh, compassionate and calm. She could have said, as an addict, she could have said, I know where we can go by, and I would have gone with her. Mm -hmm. But instead she said, I know what you need to do. Just, you need to go to a meeting, raise your hand, say what happened, and start over. And she, she was the tipping point for me. And how long ago was that? Uh, that was uh, uh, March of uh, 1992, so it's 22 years plus. Terrific. Thank you for being patient, Mr. Mayor. So as I mentioned in the introduction, you and your wife, who is a state senator in Minnesota, she's here with us. You all collectively had been in recovery for an awfully long time when unbeknownst to you, your daughter was using heroin and she died of an overdose. Some people might say, how could you not have known? What happened? Well, I think, I think I'll start with kind of what happened. Um, being in a small town, uh, born and raised in a small town, you don't think things like that will happen. Uh, being a mayor in a small, first-string suburban city, you don't think that happens to, you know, white kids in a good neighborhood with good parents. You know, things like that just doesn't happen. And um, she had come home. Um, Christmas the year before, and I, being extremely naive in uh, what recovery and what withdrawal looks like, uh, did not recognize that she uh, was trying to quit, and I believe she did for a while. I think she went through withdrawal, but I think she got to the point where uh, one more the pain is there, or, you know, I'm young, I'm 23, I'm invincible. Um, so the day after Memorial Day in 2007, um, she passed away in a fast food parking lot um, in the center of Brooklyn Center, my city, basically. I'd been in office five months, and officers responded. They couldn't save her. They were unable to administer some of the common drugs that we have in place today, naloxone or Narcan. And uh, I have to mention mom here at this point and the work that she has done in Minnesota uh, with the state senate in carrying um, the naloxone or Narcan bill and working it through the legislature in Minnesota. And it's one of the few. Let me just point out, her name, her name is Chris Eaton, and she's on the second row. So Chris, if you could just stand up, raise your hand. Chris just, just got the Naloxone Good Samaritan bill passed, so congratulations on that. It's one of the few bills in Minnesota in the legislature that has passed unanimously by both houses and signed by the governor. So um, it doesn't happen to uh, people like us is kind of where I was at. Officers responded. They couldn't save her. They didn't have the information. The individual she was with was uh, more interested in getting rid of the evidence uh, in a, one of the local fast food stores than saving her life. Um, they didn't realize she was my daughter to start with. So around five o'clock in the afternoon, I had two officers pull up uh, in two different vehicles to the front door. Not uncommon for the mayor to have something delivered, packages, uh, information. Council meeting that evening, I'm tying a tie, putting my suit on, and um, they wouldn't let my son leave the driveway. The 
and blacked him in. So I went out to see what was going on, um, knowing officers. Um, and they said, um, Mr. Mayor, I have something to tell you. And I went, you better come in the house. We, by, by their body language and the way it looked, it was, it was something serious. My son was home, my daughter wasn't, my wife was home. So um, the officer came in the house and said, I have some very bad news to tell you. Your daughter passed away this, after, this morning from a heroin overdose and we couldn't save her. It, um, it's been seven years. I still see her, hear her, see her face as if it was yesterday. Um, since then, I've become much more educated in addictions, um, alcohol addiction I kind of knew about, being almost 30 years in recovery myself, my wife and I both. <laughs> Heroin and opiates, I had no clue, didn't, didn't know. I do now. So now we've become advocates for recovery, for recovery at any level, whether it be nicotine, caffeine, alcohol, you know, whatever, whatever uh, addiction of choice. Um, I miss my daughter very, very much. Um, I think of her every day cry for every other day, and uh, I'm just very thankful that uh, my wife and I are able to support each other and understand each other and are taking a path that will help other people recover as well. We're grateful for that as well. Yeah, you know, while, while so many people in this room may understand addiction themselves, and recovery themselves, I have no idea what your loss must have been like and what it is still like each and every day. So what an honor to have you here today to shed that perspective and, and share that with us. You know, you mentioned education. And I think everyone in this room would agree that that is absolutely an essential component if we're going to deal with the stigma and the shame and the blame of this disease is educate people about it in the same way that we as a society educated people about AIDS and breast cancer and autism and some of the other ALS. I mean, look at what the ice bucket challenge, look at the awareness and all the money that was raised through that. We were talking about that earlier today. Um, but education is essential. And Christina, let me go back to you. As a young person, what do we as a recovery community need to do to effectively educate young people? I think that, you know, it's so difficult what Mayor Wilson's story shows that two incredible loving parents in recovery can still have a child um, who goes down, you know, a similar or worse path. And that can leave us, I think, at least it can leave me feeling a little hopeless sometimes. But it's not hopeless at all. And there is, there's so much that we can do. And... I think that the first thing, I mean, I really think that it's, it's sort of the education, it's the parity thing. It's that this is just as serious and this is a disease and it needs to be treated as such. And, uh, you know, earlier today we were talking about treatment and the barriers to treatment. And I was talking about the fact that I didn't have those barriers to treatment and that is why I'm sitting here today and that is why I'm two and a half years sober because... I happen to have been born to parents who could pay for treatment. And the vast, vast majority of people who are struggling with addiction in this country were, do not have that luxury. And so I think that that is where our attention really needs to be right now. So, so what do we do about that? What, what do we do about that? I'm, I'm, Chris, I'm gonna come back to you in a minute, but let, let me ask you, as the mayor of a town, what do we need to be doing for that to happen on a local level, a state level, a national level? Um, well, first of all, Christina, you, you give me some very good hope. Um, 
you were at an age my daughter was at. And you have successfully turned your life around. You're in recovery, and I, I thank you for that. It gives me a lot of hope. So um, what do we need to do? Um, <clears throat> I tell this story uh, with tears in our local school districts. We have four in our city. And I visit with third and fourth graders. And if you think they don't understand uh, what heroin is, what addiction is, Really, think again. They really as young as third and fourth grade. Third and fourth grade. That Absolutely. is that's shocking to me. Absolutely, they um, are involved. They know what blunts are. They know what uh, marijuana is. Yeah. They know all of those things. What they don't know is that there is a path to recovery. What they don't know is they don't have somebody in their lives who is recovering. Somebody that they can look up to as a mentor and say, this is my mayor. He runs the country, I've heard from a couple of times, so I don't, <laughs> don't let the president hear that part. But. Uh, I think he might hear it. <laughs> yes. But they're in awe of somebody like myself, who is a serving mayor, who is, you know, I'm just a regular Joe Schmo, you know, from a small town in southern Minnesota. And I tell them two things. I tell them, you should never touch drugs, and here's why. And I tell them my daughter's story, and they, they are, as you are here today, solemn, quiet. Uh, they're thinking. Mm -hmm. The other thing I tell them is uh, get an education. Get through the school system. Throw all this other crap out, you know, Get along with the kids you're with. Learn every day. And education is so important to you as an individual. Mm -hmm. um, college is so important as well. Um, I did not have the opportunity to go to college. Uh, but I have worked very, very hard in my life to make it amount to something much better than it was at mm -hmm. 31 when I was still using a number of different uh, vices. They well, invariably will tell me, they'll ask me, and this is third and fourth graders, what can I do to be a better citizen in Brooklyn Center? What can I do in my city to make a difference in uh, community? Build community, be a friend to your friend, uh, get an education, and listen to this story. Thank you. And I think for someone who didn't go to college, you're president now. Yes. So, wow. Yes. It really worked out for you. Yes. Um, Chris, let me ask you this. To what extent do you talk to young people? Not, not just young NFL players who you might come across or who, who you might mentor, but what do you tell young people when you do talk to them? Uh, for, for one, I think it's, it's very, very important that you utilize whatever platform that God's given you. Um, for me, I'm not necessarily involved with a lot of young people, say middle age. Um, I'm a high school football coach, and I also coach a lot of other NFL players and a lot of college players. So I try to focus on athletes. Predominantly, most of them are African Americans. So those are the people I believe that God have given in my demographics that I try to encourage, but I try to be real with them. I think there's, there's so many people out there that are so wishy-washy, and the kids see through that. The, these kids today, this is a different generation, and you need to shoot it to them straight. The number one thing I do for young people is try to be successful. Because that's the one thing black kids, it's hard for them to identify with you if you're not successful. So for me, the number one thing I can do is be real good at my job. No, I'm done playing football, so I'm not gonna be able to impress them that way. So to try to be really good on television and try to get their attention so that I might be able to say something that might be able to help them in their journey. Because every person is on a journey. You have to identify where the people are in their journey, except that. There's so many people out there, like when I was trying to get help, they wouldn't accept me where I was. You know, everybody wants, you know, life on their terms. 
You know, so I meet young people where they are. Meet them right where they are, yes. And they're smoking blunts, and they're taking mollies, and they're doing cocaine. And I'm patient with them. And the reason why I'm patient with them is I never forget when people gave up on me. I got kicked out of college, mayor, so I'm just like you. I ain't got no, I ain't got no education. <laughs> and along the way, man, people just, they just gave up. My college gave up on me. The Eagles drafted me. They gave up on me. And I only had a, a little bit of hope to hold on to. And I had a great wife, and she supported me. And, man, we grinded it out together. But you got to meet young people where they are. You need to get off your high horse, take that suit off, take that dress off, and get right down in the dirt right where these kids are. And that, for me, is the most effective way for a kid who comes from a housing project in a ghetto. I try to relate to these kids right where they are. And I accept them on any terms for which they come to me, or if it's league imposed, they have to come see me, or if it's court, you know, appointed that they have to come see me, because I never forget those days when I was lost and when people gave up on me. Before we got here today, uh, we were all having a conversation uh, at the White House earlier, inside the White House. I, yes, I'm going to say that again. <laughs> and Chris, you and, and your wife were talking about the importance of family in all of this. Could you speak to that for a minute in terms of talking, having your family close when you're in recovery or just the role of family in general? It, it's important. Me and my wife had a conversation. And I made a promise to her. Because before that, you know, I met her in college. And I went to her mom and dad and asked, you know, will you allow your daughter to marry me? On that day, though, I told her, I'll, I'll take care of you. I told her I'm going to take care of her her whole life. I'm going to make every one of her dreams come true. And she was pregnant with my son then, Duran. And we looked at our history on both sides of our family and alcoholism being on both sides of our family. And she asked me, will you give your son a chance to have a healthy life? Will you stop using for him? So me and my wife, we made a pack. And that's what I was trying to do. And that's all I'm trying to do today. And when I wake up tomorrow, that's all I'll be trying to do. And if God grant me another day, that's all I'm trying to do. When I tell you it's been 12,611,520 minutes, it's not because I'm proud, but that's just who I am. My wife realized she's married to an alcoholic and a drug addict, and I accept it. But having that family there and having her there, it was the most important thing. You couldn't teach me anything about alcohol or drugs if I didn't have no support. And I remember driving home to her and her being pregnant and me pulling up in the house. And I had never lived in a house before. And thinking I was gonna lose that house and I'm going to lose my wife and my son who's pregnant. He ain't even come into the world. He don't even have a chance. So family, friends, our support of any type is critical if we're going to win this battle. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, thank you, Chris. <laughs> we have to do this together. We can't do it alone. We don't have to do it alone, and we shouldn't do it alone. And there is a saying in the 12-step program that I'm a part of, 
we can do together what we cannot do apart, whether that's in the, in the family or with colleagues or friends or a community at large. Right. I want to switch gears and talk about the role of the media in the coverage of the, yes, I'm, I, yes, that's you, that's right, and it's me too. You know, so often the media likes to focus on the train wreck stories of the Charlie Sheens and the Lindsay Lohans and the Kiefer Sutherlands, and I, I could go on and on, but I won't. What do we, as members of the media, need to do to get more positive messages out there about the victories in recovery and not just the train wreck stories of addiction? Uh, well, I think what we're doing right now, talking about this very openly, is, uh, is a really good step. Um, I, I think you're right that too often uh, the spotlight goes to the people who are, as, as you put it, uh, train wrecks. Uh, about three, four years ago when Charlie Sheen was uh, having one of his meltdowns, uh, I, I was invited to uh, uh, talk about it uh, on an NPR show. Right. And I thought, you know, that was, there were some pretty good questions and I, I think some good information was shared. But, you know, I think it, it'd be good if we could also have uh, the spotlight put on people who struggled and got onto the other side and are, are doing well. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, uh, there's an old saying in journalism that, you know, when a, when a plane lands safely, that's not a story. Right. When it doesn't, that's the story. But I think that, um, you know, the plane could have a lot of turbulence and then land, and that could be a story too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all of us have had various kinds of emotional turbulence and we've all come through it one way or another. And I think that's something that, you know, those are the, the types of stories I think that I'd like to see more of. Mm -hmm. And obviously the role of social media is so important as we go, co as we go forward. And that's again where young people can come in as well. But Chris, you wanted to say something? Uh, well, the thing about it, I, I think that I don't think I would be honest with you if I was sitting here today being part of the media and given what we're facing in the National Football League. I think that it would help perpetuate a lie. And for me to go any further and not comment on it, I think it would be unprofessional. Um, in my business, I don't know about your business, but I'm sick. I'm sick of what I see in the National Football League. I'm not sick of the players. I'm sick of the behavior. I'm sick of the depiction of it on national TV. We have some of the best athletes in the world that have all different types of issues, some of them being drugs and alcohol, but other social issues. So to me, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart that young people would not know about the opportunities lost. So for having a voice out there in the media, to me, it's very, very important. It's very, very important that I continue to have standards. I mean, we just let our standards go out the window. But I expect standards from the National Football League. I expect standards from the Minnesota Vikings, who I played for. They're going through a tremendous controversy right now. Not nothing to do with drugs or addiction, but it's pro sports. And it's always the right time to do or tell someone the right thing. And then right now. I, I wish they would listen to you, Chris. And right now, there is, in society, we need the truth. We need to stop hiding behind laws and legislation. The lawmakers not helping us, the NFL, that's for certain. They're not helping us, so we have to continue to use our voice to try to get these players as much assistance because if it's drugs or alcohol or any other type of assistance, mental, physical, they're all the same. You know, it's interesting that you bring that up because uh, Patrick Kennedy, who's here and who we're going to be hearing from you, I think, in a few minutes, right? You talk about the importance of getting checked out, being talked to, 
Um, and just as important as it is to get a physical checkup, it's also important to get a mental health checkup. You talk about getting a checkup from the neck up. And I have to admit, I have stolen that line before, but I've always given you credit. But it seems to me that when we're talking about people in crisis, it's like you gotta do a checkup, you gotta talk to these people, find out what is going on with them so that then we can move forward. Um, we've only got two minutes left before we're gonna take some questions from Twitter. So I wanna ask each one of you very quickly, what does recovery look like to you? People, we use the word recovery a million times every day. You want to start on the other side, fine. Look, it's, the, the word is used so often, recovery, but it is not clearly defined, and I do think it's individual. What does it mean to you, Mr. Mayor? Well, more importantly, it's what it doesn't mean to me. What doesn't it mean to you? It doesn't mean that um, I don't remember where I was last night. It doesn't mean that um, I'm so hungover I can't get off the floor. Uh, it means that my children uh, are not uh, using and abusing. Um, for me, uh, recovery has been uh, one of the greatest joys in my life with my wife and my family and my surviving son, and it will continue to be. And as Chris had said, we'll continue to take it one day at a time and Thank you. Uh, go through life. Ruben, what does recovery mean? or? not mean to you? Uh, it, it means I'm not uh, putting myself in positions where I, I'm going to uh, uh, go to an early grave. It means that I have an opportunity to be, uh, instead of the worst version of myself, because I have to own the behavior that I engaged in. That I can't say that wasn't me, it was the drug. It was me, it was me on the drugs. But it, now I have an opportunity to be the best version of myself, uh, whether at work, with my family, uh, writing, whatever I'm doing, uh, now I can be the, the best, try to be the best version of myself rather than the worst. Recovery to me means it, this is who God made me. Accept it and love it. You are not perfect. We're not striving for, for perfection. But it also means it's all the power and strength that I can be anything that I want to be now, that I have discovered recovery. And the sky is the limit and all my dreams are alive and capable of being accomplished. I think recovery for me means taking life as it is. I think it means going through the triumphs, going through the tragedies, going through the minor irritations and the joy and doing it without needing to escape, without numbing myself. And then I think most importantly, it means giving it away. And I think that, you know, I learned that that's the only way I'm gonna keep it. To me, recovery means freedom on a lot of different levels. So I want to thank our panel. We're going to take some questions from Twitter now, but let's give them a round of applause. Thank you so much. So we talk about the importance of social media in our movement, and now we're going to take some questions from Twitter. David Whitesock writes, I'd really like to hear the panel talk about the role of healthcare Okay, and RCOs in solving addiction. Anybody want to talk about that? Well, I think it was alluded to earlier that um, if you're of the same color I am, you have health care, you have things you can do. Um, in my community with a very high level of diversity, uh, not everyone has health care. Not everyone can get that kind of help, and it's very expensive in order to do so. If we're going to help others into recovery, we have to build some sort of health care system that will cover everyone, not just those of us who are very fortunate to be able to be covered. So. Right. We have a next question from, okay, ba Catwoman appears asked a question. <laughs> no. um, Yes, youth education matters. How about also addressing addiction in other demographics, such as senior citizens and military vets? Um, I, I think the veterans, we're in a real crisis with our veterans, and uh, uh, my partner is here today, Joe Schrank, who is, uh, owns a sober living facility in Brooklyn. Joe recently took on a veteran who now 
lives, lives there. And it's a pro bono case. And I'm wondering if anybody here would like to talk about seniors or vets who deal, <laughs> they're, sp now when you deal with elderly people and addiction, sometimes people, well, they're just old. You know what, they'll, they'll never change, they'll just keep drinking. You know, my great aunt, she's 85, she's never gonna change, she just is who she is. And then our vets who come back so traumatized, who then are given medication, who then become not only alcoholics, but also addicted to painkillers and the like, and they get very little attention. So who wants, who wants to talk about that? Yeah, Christina. Um, I guess the young person talking about the other demographics, but I think, to be honest, I think while there are differences, a lot of the things are the same. And we talked about this earlier, which is that treatment can't just be the initial treatment. It needs to be the follow-up. It needs to be, you know, for young people, it's making sure that education is a big thing, and that's true for older people as well. It's making sure that there's housing for seniors. It's making sure that there's a community to go to, that military veterans have, you know, if they have PTSD, if they have physical health challenges, this is all encompassed in, you know, problems with drugs and alcohol. So it's making sure that we're not just addressing uh, the symptoms. Anyone else want to add? Anything to that, please. Yes, I, I will. I didn't mean to harp so much on youth, but I do think that's a, a place to start. Um, I'm going to relay what we did in Minnesota, and that was with the Steve Rumler Foundation. Steve Rumler was a very influential, successful vice president of his own company. He went in and had some um, teeth work done, and they gave him opiates for the pain. He wound up going to much more stronger uh, opiates like heroin and uh, losing his life as well. It happens across the spectrum. It's not just youth. It's middle-aged. It's elderly. Um, the goal, at least to me, is to get the message out there where it's going to do the most good. We talked about old Aunt Martha or, or whatever, and they're pretty set in their ways, and they have all kinds of rights, but you need to get to those people who are just starting out in life and uh, make sure they're educated and they understand. So. Thank you. Okay, our next question. From Aisha Herring, also known as Aisha Fairbanks. How can we change the perception of addiction and recovery in the African American community? Anybody wanna tackle that? Well, the number one thing would have to be the laws and how we have legislated <laughs> black crimes and white crimes and recovery and ideology that in the African-American community that recovery is a bad thing because our perception is an alcoholic or a drug addict is someone that has the track marks, is someone that's drinking out of a bag, that's sleeping on the corner. Like, the whole perception of it is wrong. But I think it's, if we could get to the point where people would be aware of using, you know, we, we have, as Americans, we have put celebrating with alcohol and drugs, like, that's a common thing. Now, high school graduation, let's get drunk. Bar mitzvah, let's get drunk. Let, let, let's get drunk. Like, let's football game, let's get drunk. Like, I mean, when, when do we ever? So in the African-American community, for me, you need more African-Americans that are role models that are in recovery so that they can see a positive person. Like, no, it's not JoJo on the corner. It's Chris Carter on ESPN. Right, yes. That's right. Because then, because it's no different than athletics. If I go to a certain part of D.C., they know who Chris Carter is. Yeah. They know who Kevin Durant is. They know who RG3 is. But they don't really know an alcoholic or a drug addict. Or they think they don't. No, they really don't in their mind. Even the guy that's hustling on the corner. But what the people in the Af African-American community need to realize is that the addict, sometimes he got a tie on. Sometimes he's delivering the mail. Sometimes he is the school teacher or the school teacher, and sometimes he is the lady that's teaching Sunday school. Like the pictures in our mind as a community 
you have to change those pictures and be more realistic because this is what we look like. We look like her. We look like him. <laughs> we look like her. That's what we look like. We normal people. <laughs> That's right. We come in all shapes and sizes, age, gender, whatever. Yeah, we are everywhere. Okay. Principal Gaggi. All right, Linda Gaggi, who m may or may not be a, a principal. Maybe she's a principal of a school. Okay. What is your advice to sober teens going to college? <laughs> Christina, I'm, I'm going to, I'll start with you. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, you know, I, I left college initially to get sober and yeah. to be college honest. Did you leave? Oh, God. <laughs> I left a college in Connecticut. <laughs> Yale. Okay, we're just gonna say it. You okay. left Yale. I left Yale to get sober. And <laughs> to be honest, I, okay. I think it would have been very difficult to get sober while still in college. Me too. I think it would have been supremely difficult. When Chris talks about, you know, drinking as part of our celebratory culture, like look at our collegiate culture. It is a huge, it huge is. Part. I mean, that's, that's where my drinking career really took off. I was a nerd in high school. I really was. I didn't drink at all. I got to college and it was like, <laughs> I went nuts. And the older I got, the worse it got. But that, again, is a whole other story. But is it realistic to think that you can be sober in college? I mean, the answer is yes. We are seeing the rise of collegiate recovery communities all over the country, which is fantastic. It's great. I wish we had one on every campus, but you left it. There wasn't one at Yale. There wasn't one at Yale. And when I went back, I went back to finish, you know, a year after I got sober, there was one other kid trying to get sober. And he had three years left, and I felt bad for that kid. That would have been really, really hard. Um, because sobriety is so much fun. You can have so much fun in sobriety, but if you don't have people your own age, if you don't have people to go, you know, to do fun, sober things with, forget it. Like, forget it. It's just, it's, it's nearly impossible. So I think what so many people in this room are doing with collegiate recovery programs and with high school recovery programs is immensely important, um, definitely. Right. Okay, next question from Brooke Feldman. Who would have thought, well, let me wait till it stops moving, okay. <laughs> Who would have thought the heroic journey of recovery would march right up into the White House and broadcast out to the world? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Who would have thought? I, you know, I gotta say, what a treat to be here. What role can, okay, this is from recovery community, S, SCSU, does anyone know? Which college that is, SCSU? South Carolina, State. South Carolina State University, very good. Okay, tweet coming in from them. What role can collegiate recovery programs play in countering the entrenched culture of binge drinking on college campuses? Okay, so a follow-up to what we've already been talking about. Ruben, you wanna tackle this? I know it's been a while since you've it's been in college, been a little while but go since ahead. I was in college. Uh, and when I was uh, in school, I was, um, I didn't drink often, but when I did, I really went to town. I was a binge drinker. Um, I think that uh, if there had been something like that, and I don't think there was at the school I went to at that time, uh, that might have been something that might have put me on a different path. Uh, because I think it is important to have a, a support group, a peer group. You, you know, it's, it's, I, I don't think any of us could do this alone. I know I could never have gotten this far alone, never in a hundred years. So in college, you know, that's when people really, uh, it, it's an important time in people's lives to socialize. If you have a group of people like that, I think it removes the stigma, which it, you know, in, in these days, it almost is a stigma if you don't drink at a certain age. Uh, so I think something like For that sure. could be good crucial. Point. Yeah, good point. Well, I don't, I, I don't think kids really have a scouting report. And I use a scouting report because I'm in sports. Um, if a kid has a family or a family history, he's going to be affected different when he gets into that culture as far as the binge drinking. Now, we all know in society there are people that can drink. So we can't approach all kids and act like you're going to go to college and not drink. That's unrealistic. They're going to look at us like we got two heads. But the thing about it is know yourself. Know your own family history so that you would know that I'm more apt 
to go down this road if I do this. And also put limits on yourself. Put some restrictions on yourself. What you're going to be able to do in college. Like, but do you think that's realistic to put limits on yourself when you were 18? When I, when I was in the seventh grade, I was taking a test. And I got done with my test early, and the teacher said, what are you doing? I was back there drawing a piece of paper. She said, uh, I told everyone to put their heads down when they get done with the test. And so I was still on a piece of paper. She told me, stand up. What's on that piece of paper? I said, you don't want to see it and everything. She said, yeah, stand up. Let the whole class see it. So I stood up, had a little piece of paper. I stood up. You couldn't see what it was. She said, what is that? I said, that's my autograph. She said, well, what are you doing there? I said, I'm going to be famous one day. <laughs> and the reason why I tell that is because you got to stop telling people what they can't do. We need to stop telling kids, you, you, there's no way you can go through college and not drink. Well, why no, not? No, 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 I agree. That's what I'm saying. But it comes from internally, your body will do what you tell it to do. And the sooner we can train our young people, listen, if you keep telling yourself you can't do it, you ain't going to never make it. But I believe there's people out there that can live healthy lifestyles, and there's also others of us, don't go down that road because given your genetics, you're more apt to end up on this stage or dead. Dead more likely. Yeah, I'm glad we ended up on this stage. <laughs> yeah, I was just trying to live in a house. Forget about the White House. The White house. <laughs> Do we have time for one more or no? We're going to wrap it up. All right. Wow, what a great discussion. What, and what an honor to, to lead this discussion with four such interesting, compelling people who, by all accounts, maybe shouldn't be here, but they are, we are, we're all here. We're all here to celebrate the joys of recovery and moving forward and doing what we, what we know we can do. So I wanna give my thanks and if you'll all join me in a round of applause for our panel today. Christina Huffington, Chris Carter, Ruben Castaneda and Mayor Tim Wilson. Thank you all so much for being here for the discussion today.